Well, good afternoon, everybody. Boa tarde a todos. We are so excited to welcome all of you to our um, very special event today in our In Mind series with Damien Vavel. We are so excited to have Damien because he is a special member, has become a special member of our learning community. And Damien brings years of experience in research. He currently works for Boston College and he um, does a lot of research with schools about measuring what matters, about measuring learning, about looking at mission statements and looking at how mission statements, vision statements, values, um, and all of that come together when we talk about learning and how all of that impacts learning. So today we have the great pleasure of talking to him about measuring what matters and what that represents during all of these times and what that represents in the daily lives of our children as they go into school and to understand a little bit more about the purpose of schools. Why do schools exist? What is success? How do we measure success? And how do we measure what matters? So with that, I wanna thank Damien for his time, for his partnership, and for being such a thoughtful person who has joined our community of learners. So thank you, Damien. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Priscilla. That was a great introduction. And you really wove in a number of the themes that I'm really excited to share today. So I'm gonna jump right in and I'm gonna share a little bit about the background of our work and uh, just how the perspective that we bring uh, offer something for teachers and parents and just educational stakeholders in this really unique time we find ourselves in. So unlike many of the speakers you've had and much of your local community, I have never been an elementary classroom teacher. Uh, my background and training is in measurement and statistics. And I represent uh, this, this field called psychometrics. And I think it's important for many people to just kind of stop and understand what that means. And we joke that when you meet someone with psycho in their job title, you kind of want to know what it is they do. But in all seriousness, psychometricians try to measure things that don't exist in the physical world. And so what that means is, you know, we, we think of measuring uh, distance or space or time, but a lot of the things we care most about in education or as teachers are things that don't have that physical uh, you know, connection that we can measure, things like aptitude, engagement, creativity. And so what I've tried to do is use new technologies that have emerged in schools and in industry over my 20 year career to try to advance how we do educational research and evaluation and use this field of psychometrics to be able to measure things that matter to school communities around the world. And so I've applied this research and evaluation work to studying one-to-one -to -one technologies and studying schools, again, all over the world on how they can support new resources and new developments using data and telling their story more effectively. And the good news is, is that we have entered this golden age for using data in educational measurement. And it's really exciting actually to think about that, you know, within the tools that we've given our kids and our most classroom teachers, they can connect and collect information from their students and from parents through surveys and through other resources that a generation ago were completely, uh, you know, science fiction. And then how we, analyze and we share and visualize that data and then are able to use it for formative and summative purposes provides just amazing opportunities to classroom teachers. However, when we give people these tools as educational researchers and as psychometricians, we have to help them think like psychometricians a little bit. And we have to ask these questions as Priscilla shared, how do we determine the success of our students? How do we share and communicate that success to our communities? And how do we know as we're evolving with new technologies or new teaching practices that they're having the kinds of impacts we'd like to see? And so we use data. 
And the question is, how are we using the right data? Are we measuring the right things? And so this leads us to this bigger question. What is the purpose of school? And you know, a lot of educational research assumes the purpose of school is academic and cognitive test scores. And what we found is that's only one aspect of school purpose. And I'm gonna share this short video from my colleague, Steve Stemmler at Wesleyan University as he uh, discusses how the purpose of school has shifted over time. So I think I'm uh, sharing this effectively. Here's Steve Stemmler from Wesleyan. The purpose of school has shifted many times uh, over the course of history. Uh, we can see eras in which citizenship has played a major role. For example, in the United States in the early 1900s, schools were their major focus was to develop and inculcate uh, effective citizens as there was a wave of immigrants. Later, we saw a focus on cognitive academic skills to try to ensure high standards uh, for workers and cognitive abilities for leaders. We've seen a shift in the 80s to emotional development, trying to understand how people uh, develop self-esteem, self-awareness. And we've seen a uh, focus on empathy. And these things change over time in terms of their major uh, pull historically. But the three components that we found across our research are emotional development, civic development, and cognitive development. And those three have stayed fairly invariant as core purposes of school over time. Only the emphasis changes over time. So thanks, Steve, uh, for sharing that with us. Um, and so, as Steve said, we've been researching uh, the purpose of school. And what we have found is that, you know, there are a number of perspectives on what the purpose of school should be. And, you know, people have looked at, um, you know, how governments present uh, the purpose of school or how constitutions define that. Um, people go and do surveys of business leaders or CEOs. People ask parents, but rarely has anyone actually looked at the school's perspective. And Steve and I, both being trained data guys uh, from Boston College, we decided that we could find maybe data points and think about creating a rubric that would help us. And we realized almost every school in the world had a mission statement. And so we went about and coded thousands and thousands of mission statements using a technique called emergent analytic content analysis. And what we found were these 11 themes kept coming up over and over again and K-12 mission statements, both public, private, and you know, from a variety of states and, and nations. And we could quantify from a sample of schools how frequent these themes were occurring and focus on them. And so, for example, in a recent study uh, we just got published this week, I'm excited by, um, where we looked at the mission statements of Massachusetts public high schools. And we looked at how the mission statements had changed over an 18 year period. And the point I'll just make here is that these are the percent of the different themes that were presented across that sample of mission statements. And we see again, emotional development was present in 91% of our 2019 sample. So the vast majority of high schools are talking about emotional development. We also see 86% of schools talking about cognitive and academic development. 67% talking about civic development, so on and so forth. And what you realize is that most schools are talking about multiple themes. In fact, in that study, the average high school had over six themes present in their mission, unique themes. So our most common themes that we find are emotional development, cognitive, civic, and social development. And we think about how we can think about what matters by looking at our mission and thinking ourselves about what matters to us. Why did we become a teacher? How do we define that success? How are students achieving success in all of those areas? And how can we better capture and quantify student and teacher voice towards those success indicators? And we have this model here. And as I mentioned, Steve Stemmler and I have worked together for many years. Uh, after working with mission statements a long time, we realized that we could connect them with this model to assessment. And by thinking about the components in your mission, 
and also thinking about how you implement those components through curriculum and budget and day-to-day -day decisions also provide this opportunity for alignment or congruence with what you're measuring. And so we look with you know, schools or organizations, are they actually assessing what it is they say their, their, their mission is? And in most cases, they're not, or only partially. And that's where these opportunities come up. And so you know, we're really lucky to have Escola Concept as a, a host here uh, for these opportunities to talk about these big issues. And you know, we can pick on our hosts and I pulled up their mission statement and I sort of you know, applied our coding rubric and looked at the kinds of different thematic elements. And I think what's important here again is it's not just one theme. Like most schools, they're looking at a variety of representations of the whole child. And it's not just academic and cognitive. And so this is a great opportunity. I think we'll pause for a second and I will, um, uh, I think, have uh, Priscilla join me and maybe we'll just have a moment of debrief and questions. Um, and then we're going to talk about how all of those different components end up, uh, you know, what opportunities and challenges exist for looking at academic measurement and, and uh emotional and social development being measured and assessing those pieces. So we'll stop now and, and uh, take a breath and then we'll dive into some practical examples across those different themes. Thank you, Damien. Wow, that yeah. gave us a lot of food for thought um, and it really provoked um, some thinking on our end and it provoked some thinking um, with some of the folks that are, you know, Matt, uh, quickly sending us some questions because um, they're interested in learning a little bit more about what you had to say with regards to mission statement, purpose of school, learning, and all of those trends that have been observed. But one of the things that stand, one of the things that stand out is with regards to um, when your colleague uh, spoke and he talked about how the purpose of schools um, and the focus of schools has evolved historically throughout time. He mentioned mm -hmm. it going from you know, being effective citizens to emotional development, to empathy. But then at the end, when you guys kind of boiled it all down, purpose of schools, you can summarize it, you know, with three, three, three basic things, emotional, civic, and cognitive. And with that being said, when we think of mission statements um, and we think of purpose of schools and we think of measuring what matters, have you and your colleagues had the opportunity to track or measure the academic success of children based on the mission and the purpose of schools? Yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to see that full circle right. and such that there are definite, um, you know, it, it's the kind of situation where I don't think you ever reach the point where you're like, yes, we are, completely congruent. We're assessing kids on exactly the right criteria. But what we see are schools that become more cognizant that there's more to it than just the, the traditional grades and test scores. Right. And so I think step one is kind of this realization that we have this really broad mission and there's all these things we care about. But, you know, why is our valedictorian picked based just on GPA? And why are all our awards, you know, based on two or three qualities? Like why, if we're a Jesuit, you know, Boston College is a Jesuit school. And, you know, if, if you know, we have this really broad mission statement as a, as a university and as our own school of education. And, you know, if we're only evaluating, you know, our faculty or our students based on one aspect of that mission, we're not really serving them. So there's this opportunity to look beyond academics. And if your mission is looking at Jesuit ideals or, you know, uh, creating resilient learners and you're only, you know, giving kids content scores, you're doing them a disservice. So I think step one is that realization that there's some misalignment. And I think a lot of schools can get to that point pretty quickly. And then it's like, well, what do we do? And that's always been a challenge because there's been a disconnect between where the policymakers are and how they define success and how the teachers and the parents and the people kind of within our local communities define success. 
And so often schools kind of push up against, you know, well, we can do so much, but when the state test comes, every student has to have these academic standards and that's how our teachers will be evaluated. And that's how our students will ultimately get into the high school of their choice or the college of their choice. And so it's a long answer to your, to your question in that, yes, there are some examples, but they're very much um, piecemeal is, is, is almost giving it, you know, a, 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 a negative connotation it doesn't deserve, but right. schools are taking bites of it right. and, and looking at pieces. And, and I'll be sharing, I'll bring out a few examples as we continue the discussion to highlight some of those little steps people are taking. Or we can even say there's pockets, right, of greatness that are, you know, maybe yeah. popping yeah. up right here and there. Um, you know, so one school will be really good at like, you know, developing a social emotional index and, and building the capacity with their faculty and their community to do that, but they might not have got around to citizenship yet. Right, that right. And um, Damien, if you could, so, you know, sometimes when we're, when we're having these conversations um, with educational experts, sometimes parents feel like, wow, like these are great conversations, but sometimes um, the topic is so dense that they feel like, okay, so how can I connect to um, what is being shared? And um, I think uh, if, if we were to try to bring this to a connection, we know that a lot of families, especially um, in Sao Paulo, where we have so many schools to, to choose from, families visit lots of schools before they make a decision. Really between seven to 10 schools is the average that families um, are visiting before they decide this is the, ch the school that I want my child to, to attend. And then of course, there's numerous, uh, diff numerous reasons as to why they make one choice over the other. But if you were to um, say to parents, if you were to say, you know what, if we're going to, um, if you're going to look for a school for your child, um, looking at measuring what matters, you should look at blank. What would that be? Yeah, I mean, th there's two things. One is mission. I mean, and you probably knew I was going to say that um, because, you know, I think school mission does set, you know, in a good school with good leadership, kind of that, that, that culture and framework and sets the bar, if nothing else. And it, we do see differences across schools. Um, you know, particularly in competitive markets where some schools are, you know, focused in one direction and other schools are differentiating themselves with another kind of emphasis. And so I think the mission is a good step. And then the follow-up piece is when you see their graduates, what are the qualities that they're being held to? Right. And do they have, I mean, is it evident that, you know, those students, even in a primary school, are going off and, and having the types of skills the mission is espousing. So are they caring? Are they communicative? Are they you know, reasonable in the ways uh, you'd expect? Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I think that, that helps because when you look at the mission statement and you look at the core values or you look at the pillars of the school and what the school stands for and what it represents, and then you find evidence and artifacts of those things along your tour of the school and when you talk to the people that are in the school and when you talk to families that are already enrolled in the school, then you can start building kind of like your own portfolio of artifacts and evidence to see if what is being said is what is being practiced and then that can help you make a decision. I think in a nutshell we'll, that would be it, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that portfolio idea as well um, before we're done today. And, and the other thing, just for parents, I think that's really important is to think about what do you think the purpose of school is, right? right. I mean, parents have a huge voice here. And uh, particularly if there's a competitive school market, right. think about and have that conversation. Like, it, it, and it's quite different probably even within households, you know, like the father thinks, you know, this is what's really most important and the mother might think something different. And it's, we find that it's like really easy to carry that assumption because we all went to school, we all kind of had school experiences and we all kind of assume everybody else did. Right. But what we find out when we start talking about it, it's like, wait, what matters to you? Like what is important about being in sixth grade? Right. 
right. or in primary, right? And that might be really different for different people. And, and so that first step is like finding out for yourself what matters and looking at maybe mission statements and visiting seven to 10 schools is a great opportunity to kind of self-reflect and make sure you're making that right decision. So not only will your child be better served, but you're kind of aligned with the school and you'll feel good about what they're doing and the investment you're making in your own family. That's correct, that's correct. That's, I guess that's a great takeaway um, for families, right? To really yeah. go out there. And, and the big question I think as well, Damien, and I think we're, we're gonna be able to have more insight on this as we progress through, your, through the talk with you is the fact that you know, during the pandemic, you, you know, parents and families, everybody has been really close to the schools because schools are now inside your living room, I, I right? They're see. inside your home, inside your apartment. And with that, you can really um, try to hone in on what is the focus and the purpose of education for my child? And how does it differ now from being at home and virtual learning to being on campus? Right. And then and then thinking about maybe being in the hybrid model. Right. So yeah. there's lots of um, reflections that can also come up just during the pandemic time that perhaps wouldn't come up if we hadn't hadn't been going through these times. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's definitely changing. I mean, you know, we were trying to study like the, the purpose of school as it evolved very slowly, you know, in like centuries or decades. And we're seeing now like weeks you know, like March and April, like what people were telling us, like teachers, they were like, well, this was what I was thinking about. I was going to do in April and that all went out the window and I'm doing, you know, 15% or 40% of my academics, but now I'm working on this like wellness program. I'm working on this, um, you know, uh, emotional connection unit. Um, we're working on like what citizenship means in these kinds of times. And so, you know, those schools that had the opportunity to be flexible could move in that direction, I think. And, uh, but boy, the purpose of school has been, um, you know, gone from this big idea kind of question to very visceral and literally in people's bedrooms. Awesome. Well, I'm going to stop talking and stop asking you questions okay. and let you yeah. carry on so that we can, uh, we can stop later on for a little bit more. Sounds great. Thank Thanks. you. So what I'm gonna talk about next and, and kind of continue with our presentation and some of the work that we've done is, is talk about each of those themes that schools espouse. And we, again, these are coming out of the mission statement research. And when we think about measuring success in schools, when we think about testing, we typically think about academic and cognitive tests, right? You know, the, the end of the, the spelling test at the end of the week, the big test the state gives, and, and we've had technology that's allowed this for about 75 years now. And we're all pretty familiar with what this used to look like. And again, in the last three or four months, we've seen cognitive and academic development um, and the assessment of it just kind of, you know, get very fractured. And many places, you know, very traditional schools kind of move to like a substitution model. If we can't do our typical assessment programs in a classroom, we'll just move them to the online environment. And so there's all these services like ProctorU or Examity that basically provide, you know, some degree of technology for at-home test proctoring. So we see schools um, just sort of just made that kind of wholesale switch and basically continued doing what they've always done, but in this online environment, okay? We've seen um, larger testing programs like the College Board take a few different approaches. The SAT was basically canceled or postponed throughout all of the spring and summer administrations. Um, this has led or has precipitated many uh, colleges and universities, including the University of California system, and UConn to uh, not use the SAT or ACT in future student admissions. So a major fissure and crack in a very old traditional system. Um, while the SAT was kind of postponed, the college board moved to an online home version of the AP exam and over 1 million exams were completed in May. 
it looked like it was a fairly successful administration. Uh, they had a 1% failure rate, which sounds pretty good, considering you're not the 1% of kids who ended up having their score not accepted. So a lot of challenges moving to that substitution online model. What we know is that all standardized testing in almost every school and country for 2020 is going to have some question to its validity. There's going to be an asterisk in the data file. Um, the standardization, it's part of the term standardized test, is kind of out the window. Um, so many schools have moved to an optional grading system or pass fail models. We see this in K-12 around the world. We also see it in university systems. What this allows, you know, is kind of like, uh, uh, you know, how can we make lemonade from this lemon? But it's an opportunity to rethink the role of how we're using assessment around student mastery. And a number of schools have started to take this as an opportunity to sort of push toward doing a uh, rethink on what academic assessment looks like. And one example I've worked with is Connie White at the Woodward Academy. It's a large school. I believe they have over 400 teachers. And so um, they are providing resources for teachers to think about not just their traditional you know, end of unit tests, but how to really rethink formative, summative, and diagnostic assessment because there's these new needs, okay? So cognitive testing, it's kind of like what we think about when we think about assessment and testing in school. But we also know emotional development is incredibly important. In fact, it's probably never been more important. And these are the kinds of ideas and themes that come out of school mission statements. Things like reaching your potential, having a joy for learning, being a lifelong learning, having a morality. And so these kinds of ideas, if anything, have never been more critical than they are right now. And when we think about assessment, you know, we think of these very traditional assessments, but teachers are always assessing students' emotional development and social development. And I've been lucky to spend a lot of time visiting classrooms and observing and seeing these amazing teachers who just kind of know when, you know, kids need help. And this face-to-face -face time over 180 school days has provided these mechanisms for teachers to be able to keep tabs on their kids. And without that, with home learning, we have to adopt and adapt these new techniques. And because I've worked you know, remotely in schools around the world, I've been trying to use these techniques myself. So there's some opportunity to kind of use them now in you know, traditional, taking them out of the ivory tower as it were and bringing them into the classroom. And so we're gonna talk about surveys and drawings and just some emerging tech that allows teachers to be a little more responsive around assessment with emotional development, because we know it's important. So I'm gonna share a couple quick examples. Um, this is one of my favorites. I was very lucky uh, to work at the American School of Bombay for a number of years, as um, they rolled out some really fantastic educational technology and professional learning programs. And one of the projects they did, this was a, a fourth grade teacher named Martin Rinsmung, and he did a morning meeting every day with his students. There was, I think, about 20, students in his class and the fourth graders would gather and they just talk about, you know, what they had for breakfast. It was the way they started their day. And Martin realized there was this opportunity to kind of create data from that talk. And so with the work of Sujoy Chudhari, who was a parent at the school and an incredibly gifted programmer, they created this simple daily survey. And they asked kids, what time did you go to bed last night? What did you have for breakfast? How are you feeling this morning? It was like seven or eight questions that kids would answer every day in morning meeting using their iPad or a tablet device. And the teachers would then be able to manipulate and access that data. We also, they were also able to collect the day of the week and there was some timestamp information about you know, the background and demographics of the students. This tool allowed teachers an opportunity to engage with students around how they were feeling how and how they were feeling was impacted by not having breakfast or staying up too late and the kids themselves were able to interact through these data visualization tools and those bubble plots and actually manipulate and see patterns in their own classroom of, of how kids were doing over time so it was a really just neat 
simple example of taking a survey and kind of putting it uh, to the next level with technology and allowing that to have this whole new um, value, not just substitution, but actually augmenting or redefining the role of getting that formative data and then having to opportunity to use it for summative as well. So really exciting, we've adapted this in public schools uh, in Western Michigan and used it in a number of other uh, schools and applications. Really interesting. Another example, this is um, very recent, we're actually right in the middle of doing an evaluation uh, of a pilot. This is the Linhua Primary School, a public primary school in Singapore. And the school has eight core values. They're things like diligence, resilience, self-discipline, compassion and unity. Many schools have these kind of, you know, values uh, or, you know, pillars that they hold up. But again, very few schools have the means of trying to define or assess those. And Tom Collin, a, a developer and uh, entrepreneur from Singapore, uh, has developed this app Holo Tracker that a teacher uses on their phone that is aligned with the eight specific school values. And when a student exhibits this value or one of these you know, things in the classroom, they can very quickly pull up this map, um, locate the student and create a record of the intensity and that observed behavior. And the idea is this happens very quickly and very seamlessly once a teacher is used to this. And it provides a mechanism for being able to communicate back with parents and also be able to talk about with students and understand patterns across the whole child. Again, not just focused on their academic and cognitive outcomes, but to be able to at least address some of the um, best practices or examples or, you know, uh, really what is going to show um, impact, not just in test scores, but student behavior, student attitudes and emotions. So it's allowing the school to move a little further toward telling that whole story. And, you know, we think about technology and it's exciting to think about how technology can sort of open these doors for new ways of collecting data, but data can be collected very simply and it's everywhere around us. And teachers do something really naturally and we call it in, in our field like sizing up assessment. And they have this, again, this natural idea of what's going on in their classroom. And when we talk about using drawings or surveys, we're not talking about replacing that. We're talking about complementing that and being able to just bring a tool that allows the student voice or the parent voice to be uh, just a little uh, unfiltered and uh, collected and summarized in a way that can be valuable. And so student drawings are amazing tool for doing this. And they work across all kinds of cultures and uh, age levels and with all kinds of different prompts. And this particular drawing I collected a few years ago in New York City. This was a public school. And I asked the students to draw themselves either learning English or drawing learning math in their classroom. And it was a random assignment as I walked around different schools as part of a, a study of technology. And this drawing shows a really positive classroom. We can see from the drawing, it's not just English being depicted. We also see students doing math. We see kids doing writing. We see kids reading. And over in the corner, we see kids doing science. So we have multiple stations happening simultaneously. The kids are all depicted very positively. And we don't even see a teacher present, that's obvious. So, um, you know, a very powerful image that contains actually a lot of data about what a classroom felt and looked like for one young learner. That very same day, I went across the street to another school we were working in, and I asked the same prompt, which was, think about yourself in the classroom, in the space below, draw a picture of yourself learning English in school. And so again, just asking students to depict their environment can provide us a lot of insights. And having been in both of these classrooms, they're pretty valid representations of what they felt like and what they look like. You can see the teachers depicted here at the front of the room, speaking, blah, blah, blah. There's a bunch of, uh, you know, kind of long math problems on the smart board. There's an easel next to the teacher and all the students are in this grid uh, 
And if their affect is positive, it's only the first two students in the front row. Uh, almost the rest of the students are negatively depicted. And one poor young man isn't even on the rug all the way. So again, these drawings, both collected the same day with the same prompt, show the value in using drawings for reflection. And I'd like to just give a shout out to Professor Walt Haney. Um, in addition to being my mentor, he's done probably more than anyone to bring awareness of the research opportunities and the empirical qualities for using drawings, not just for reflection and professional development, but for actually in, in some pretty serious research studies and as evidence of student uh, learning or experience changing. And so what's really cool about the drawings is they can be very much adapted. So I'm gonna share a couple examples of prompts that were draw a picture of yourself reading at home or draw your picture of yourself learning math in the classroom. And then once the drawings are collected, they can be coded and they can be used for descriptive research or comparing um, two different uh, approaches or two different kinds of schools or classrooms. Or you can see how drawings change over time as you introduce new resources or try new pedagogical approaches. And you know, again, we use a rubric to try to code those drawings. And uh, the website Drawing on Math provides a ton of resources, um, not just for drawing math classrooms, but using drawings for research and reflection in general. And so, as I said before, we try to quantify these drawings. And so we develop a rubric and we use that rubric to very simply dichotomously code different features that are present in a drawing. And so I'm gonna just share one example. This is from uh, the Emma K. Daub Elementary School. I had the privilege of visiting the school in Washington County, Maryland. And they engaged in a larger research uh, study a few years ago that was investigating how digital leveled interactive texts brought on, brought back to home, you know, for home reading would impact students, okay? So they're giving kids iPads to be able to take home and not just sort of, you know, do basic substitution, but actually use some of the features embedded in the uh, interactive books. And so very simply, as part of this larger inquiry, they decided to say, what does reading look like at home? And simply have kids using their iPad, uh, using Paper 350 or Sketchbook Pro, depict what, those, what their world looked like, okay? And this was really insightful for teachers who would obviously, you know, this is before we were Zooming inside of kids' homes every day. So just, you know, a glimpse into a kid's home through their own eyes was kind of novel. And they took it a little further than that, though. They actually coded the drawings and they set this up in a pre-post study because remember, they're trying to understand what the impact is of this new initiative. And so they're coding things like students' emotion as they're depicted reading, what kind of tools they're using. Were they doing you know, digital tools or paper and pens, paper tools? And then were there other books present? And then were there other adults present? And so here's a few examples. What does reading look like at home? Another example, the text says, I'm reading late at night. Uh, the arrow shows a random book and the time is stamped 9.53 PM. So again, just you know, very different depictions from different students on what that might look like for them reading at home. We also see you know, some very comfortable environments. Again, we see positive student depiction we can see the student is using technology. We can see the student is interacting. There's other people present, they're talking about the book and it's very positive. So again, the school under sort of the credit and thanks of course to the principal Catherine Poland and you can find more of her work at projectloop.com. But you know, they were able to take these drawings and code them as a team of teachers and leadership and actually demonstrate that there were changes after they implemented that program. So it was very self-serving and it was able to inform their next iteration and actually improve what they were doing. So, you know, there's a lot of high tech ways we can think about measuring success, but I'm a real fan of, of just simplicity as well. Okay. And so we're gonna talk about civic development. 
and again, this was an important theme and we've, I think, you know, thinking about education today, uh, some of these themes mean different things than they even did six months ago, what civic responsibility looks like. And so I'm gonna share a very general example. And this is from a high school in Maine uh, called the Foxcroft Academy. And they have, again, like many schools, a very broad mission. And they have these standards in their mission, like core values. And the core values include things like being a responsible and informed citizenship. And I'm only gonna share a short video about how the school has developed a portfolio system to ensure that their students are meeting each of the mission standards. And I'm excited to share this video. We just produced it. Um, we visited the school back in November and it's about three minutes long and the school shares their story of how students um, have to understand and reflect each of those standards that the school espouses in their mission and develop a portfolio and then present it. So. Your way, whatever you want. You can, I have students that are in AP classes. Do they also take shop classes? I have them that are taking uh, you know, special ed students. So we, we see the full gamut of those students. Most US high schools espouse between three and six broadly defined themes in their mission statement but few high schools actively measure beyond traditional academic and cognitive outcomes like test scores and grades. What drew us to Foxcroft Academy is their mission standards portfolio, which uses a simple online portfolio and senior presentation, helping to ensure each student understands and can personally apply all components of the mission. And so we came up with this idea of a graduation portfolio that would be standards based so it had integrity with the same kind of grading practices and structural components as our regular classrooms already had. And so we just broke it down into some building blocks and we've got fancy names for them, but basically it's are you an effective communicator. Are you involved with your community. Are you taking the lead on your academic experience and your learning experience? Are you solving problems? Are you using your knowledge? And are you pulling a bunch of different things together to solve those problems? We want to make sure that those things are happening across the board. And we want to make sure that your child is thinking about their day to day experiences, not just in terms of passing English or passing French or passing their math class, but in terms of building up these big picture skills to be ready for life after high school, to be successful in that life. So all we're asking for the students to do is to keep some examples of work that they've done through the classroom, or to be thinking about if it's not in the classroom, and they're out in the field or on the community during a, doing a service project, take some pictures or save that paper that you wrote and just put it in a place for later. And then when we get to the junior and senior year, we're gonna ask you to start looking through that for some examples of your best work and then helping us to understand through this thing that we call a reflection document, but it's really just you telling us, why is this thing that you did actually evidence of your ability to communicate clearly or to solve problems or to pull information from multiple resources? And we're gonna have you do that and then pick the one best thing from that and give a presentation on it. So let me go back. So the mission standards provides this vehicle that the school can ensure that every student is able to understand and apply personally each of the standards that the school and the community has determined is important. And they've been working on this for about five or seven years. And I'm really pleased uh, to report that they continued this year, despite the challenges of having their campus closed in early March and seniors all cast into the wind. Um, the last time I spoke to the school leadership they had received 109 of 115 completed mission standard portfolios from their students. So it looks like um, this year again was a very successful 
uh, way of ensuring that their graduates not just have the academic qualities, but really understand what that graduate diploma, what that diploma means. And so as my last example, we're going to move from up in Maine down to a school in the uh, Eastern, down the East Coast to Florida and the North Broward Preparatory School. And again, I've had uh, the real privilege of spending some time and working at this school. And, you know, one example is as they focus on measuring social development, again, this is a large school with a, a big campus and a lot of teachers, as they move to this offline model, the leadership meets every week. And what they've been doing is mining the data from all of the online learning resources they have. So which students are logging in when, how many minutes are you know getting logged in by fifth graders versus sixth graders, how soon are kids uh, you know, turning in assignments before they're due? How late are kids logging into the system? You know, questions that they're trying to address about what teaching and learning looks like today through looking at data from their users and, and being able to share that in with the community and use that to engage teachers in understanding what works and what doesn't work. And the school has always had this real emphasis on you know, visible thinking, and so it's provided this opportunity to move toward new ways of looking at how kids collaborate. And as I understand, they're even beginning to look at like using like mapping uh, how different kids um, interact in an online collaborative space and looking at like a social network analysis. And what happens is a school makes these jumps and you'll see from the quote, I won't read it, from their director of educational and informational technology, Alex Pajanski, as you make this move toward providing feedback to your schools about the things that teachers and the community think matter, you all of a sudden are creating a new culture and you have this opportunity to think beyond data. The data is simply informing the conversations your teachers and your parents have always wanted to have, but you're shining a little bit of a light on it. And just a, a quick shout out to the Zurich International School. Uh, they had spent a couple days, we had done some survey work together and you know, really had teachers unpack what that data meant for them. And they had tables you could write on and it's a process. And it's about building a community of using data, not to drive all your decisions, but to inform the innovations and, and the decisions that you make and have that be part of your uh, palette and toolbox for moving forward. And eventually we hope that we can measure what teachers and parents think is actually most important and be able to align all schools with their own unique missions and their own values and their own biodiverse communities that they're serving with the kinds of assessments that reflect their values and their qualities. And ultimately that allows schools and classrooms and students themselves to better tell their own story of success. And that's really why we're using data uh, as teachers in the, in the first place. And so pretty much everything I've shared today is accessible in papers or the videos. Um, anyone can write to me at bbell at bc.edu and I'm glad to provide follow-up uh, materials and uh, insights and jokes about all of uh, the projects I shared. So um, it's a real privilege to just be able to share the work today, Priscilla, thank you. And uh, I think we have time to continue the discussion a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Damien. This was so inspirational. And it is always very thought provoking to listen to you thinking and to listen to you speaking. Um, I love to listen to the thinking that goes on in your head as you're speaking. So that's, I think, the funnest part for me. So it, it, I can picture the wheels turning as you're talking. So that's a lot of fun, always. Um, Coincidentally, I uh, got to spend time in one of the schools, well, two of the schools actually that you mentioned, but at Foxcroft, uh, a very good friend of mine went to, was a boarding uh, student there. And I got to spend a month there as a student when I was growing up. Isn't that interesting? I so, thought that was fascinating. Um, as we, you know, as, as we listened to you talk, there were so many questions that popped up. Uh, my phone was actually on fire. But um, so I'm going to try to address some of these and try to bring some of them together as well. 
But one of the questions that I thought was really interesting was the fact that, you know, as we said before, schools are now part of our homes and schools are now part of um, part of our families. And they are now ha now have become woven into the daily lives and the daily routines of inside the home. So it becomes really easy for families to um, really see what's happening in schools, talking to their, their friends on the phone and saying, so what's your child learning? What's your child learning? What grade is your child? Oh, what are they learning today? What was the math lesson? What was the science lesson? And so based on the fact that, you know, individual success is defined in so many different ways and learners have different learning styles, um, what message would you give to parents who have this tendency, this burning desire to compare their children to other peers, you know, and to say, saying, okay, well, let me call my friend and see what chapter they're on or what they're learning. Um, so what message would you send to parents um, about, you know, about that, um, about that urge? And sometimes that urge ends up leading to, oh, my child is less academically capable. Um, I'm so frustrated. And so what's the message, Damien? What, what would you, what would you yeah. have to share? Yeah, I'm a parent too. So, I mean, I, I, I get that 100%. And, you know, the first thing I would say to the parents is that perhaps they are, would be interested in a career in educational research because, you know, that is what we do is try to compare. And the question is that, you know, where, you know, the comparisons are kind of agnostic, but then you get these value judgments. And so like data in and of itself is like agnostic. So if your student's on page 43 and my student's on page 53, the fact, you know, that doesn't mean anything in and of itself, but as parents, it's what we value and what we think that means is where we get into trouble. And in my line of work, they call that the inference that you make. Like the data is kind of like pure, but the inferences get you into trouble. Right. And so what I would think, you know, my message I think for parents or, or even teachers or anyone is to think about and, and said before, you know, what, what are your biases and what are your right. assumptions? Right. And, you know, why is it that reading something the fastest is the best? And, and maybe you're in, maybe it is, and that's fine, but to at least recognize that. Right. And yeah. most schools, and, and from what I understand of your community and your school, we, we recognize and we value biodiversity. We, we want a school that has different people with different strengths and doing different things. And, and, you know, like in colleges, we actually try to like build admissions departments and classes. So they have all these different qualities and everyone complements each other. And when parents see it, it's like, it's disconcerting. And we always want what's best for our own kid. And you want to sort of compare based on our own um, biases and assumptions. True. And True. there are cultures, there are school systems, you know, from what I understand, in public school in France, every student does the exact same thing through primary school. Mm -hmm. So if I have 14 grandkids in 14 different elementary schools, they were all on page 64 on October 15th. And the, there, there's a value to that in the system. They, they espouse to that and they like it. A lot of cultures look at that and say, no, that's not for us. We're gonna meet every kid's need in real time and that could be messy. And that means some kids are gonna be two books ahead and other kids won't. That in and of itself isn't a problem. It's if that matches what our assumptions are and what our values are, then it, it becomes like good data or data that we're misusing because we're making this inference that like everyone should be at the exact same place at the exact same time. Right. And that's I just think, not where we're at. Yeah, I think this connects beautifully as well to the um, previous uh, conversation that we were having about, you know, when you're looking for the perfect school for your child, how do you define that? And when you go out and you investigate the mission, vision, values, pillars, and then you start as a parent collecting data and artifacts about what this actually looks like in practice. And then you make a decision about where your child is gonna to go to school. I think it connects with this question because it, it again goes to, you know, if you value what happens in France, 
in um, the French public school system, you probably won't value what happens at concept. So you need to understand, you know, what you value, right? Um, and understand that vanilla isn't chocolate and isn't, you know, mango sorbet explosion with star fruit, right? Like they're all different, right? They're all different flavors and they're all going to give you a different experience, but you just need to know what is it that, what kind of experience do you want at a given day at a given time, right? So I think it go, kind of goes back to that. Yeah. And, and I think it's not just, you know, I mean, we talked about like your own assumptions as a teacher or as a parent and right. what you value yourself, but then you have to sort of say, well, what's best for my student? Right. And that's really hard to do because, you know, we have our own experiences and, you know, even as a educational researcher, it's very hard for me not to look at my daughter's educational experience or the way, you know, she might respond to an assignment and reflect from my viewpoint. Right. And, you know, the way I would learn might be very, very different than she. And I might actually be doing her a disservice by right. overriding that. I have to think, you know, I have to stop myself a lot. Think, wait. Right. And, and I think we have, the more we can do that and realize where we're coming from and what we value, the better we'll be able to serve, you know, not just ourselves as staying sane and feeling good about the schools we send ourselves, kid, our, our children to, but actually providing kids the best actual opportunity for the kind of learner they are. Right. Yeah. And I think that um, this goes back to another comment that you made. So I'm kind of connecting these conversations, kind of weaving them together now, which is um, when, when I speak to admissions officers from various universities, one of the things that they shared very clearly is we do not want 100 class presidents you know, 200 trombone players, 300 captains of the swim team. We want one captain of the swim team. We want one artist. We want what, you know, so we want the banjo player, the ukulele. We want the, you know, we want to make this as biodiverse as possible so that everybody can learn from one another and that we can have a whole network and ecosystem um, that is so powerful and so valuable inside our universities that our students are going to benefit and grow from that environment. So I think we all also need to keep that in mind because the only way you'll get that is if you have that model when you're growing up and when you're going through the system. So um, just something Absolutely. to kind of keep in mind. And that's also, I, you know, my final point will be we're seeing that not just in the university system, right. but in industry and in, you know, technology sector. I mean, right. Google very famously moved from, you know, hiring only, you know, top tier graduates to, you know, we want to build a diverse team with all kinds of inputs. And we're seeing that in countries like Singapore, it, it, like a national level, move toward this value system that there is just more than being the valedictorian. And we love the valedictorian and we need right. the valedictorian, but if we wanna have the best possible team to solve a problem, we know that a team of valedictorians might not get us there. That's the problem. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. I think um, one of the things that COVID-19 showed us is that we really need um, <sighs> different tools, tools that don't exist yet to solve the problems that are new to our society. We can't keep trying to use the same tools to solve new problems. And uh, Mario Kilinen from Finland, the head of uh, education there, she had the opportunity of participating with us in one of the In Mind series and um, on May 14th. And she was able to bring that very clearly to us with regards to all the research that has been done in that um, area and how important it is for us to start looking at, you know what, we need new ways to solve new problems. And if we continue to teach in the same old ways, we're never going to get there because the children that we're educating today are the ones that are going to have are, are going are the ones that are, will have to be able to um, think in that capacity. Right. So I think that's just fascinating to think about that. And, and I think it's true, not just at the meta level, but it's also true within like each of these little struggles that we have as teachers and learners that, you know, the same tool, you know, won't fix the problem. We have to reinvent new approaches 
to, for each of these problems. And, right. and it's not just you know, that's why we have educational technology and that's why we're doing this via Zoom on, you know, YouTube Live and, you know, right. it, it necessitates the technology provides these opportunities. And it's, again, they're, they're kind of agnostic like data, but how we use them and that then therein provides their value, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Damien, I think I could just sit here the whole day and just have dinner <laughs> with you. It's gotten dark. It's gotten dark. Continue the conversation, right? But I know it's six o'clock our time, it's five o'clock your time, and we promised you that we would let you go um, after an hour. So I don't wanna keep you very long, um, but I'm sure that a lot of us are still gonna reach out to you to continue this conversation. And of course, our school will definitely continue this partnership with you so that we can continue this conversation at so many different levels. So I wanna thank you so much for your humbleness and for the opportunity of being able to chat with you, to listen to your thinking, and at the same time to collaborate in this conversation, which was so rich. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And it's a privilege you know, to get to come out. You know, Most psychometricians spend most of their time looking at spreadsheets and data. So to get to talk about this stuff and engage was really fun. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we are so excited to welcome all of you um, for our next series of talks. So tomorrow we have a Morning Bites conversation um, about bilingual education, which is going to be very exciting. And then um, next week, we have another conversation focused on digital fluency with the head of education for Google Latin America. So we are so excited about all of these opportunities and we want to thank all of you for engaging and participating with us and learning with us and learning from us. So thank you, have a great night and thank you so much.